This is Join Us in France, episode 38. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And we welcome you to the Join Us in France travel podcast. Elise is a professional tour guide, art historian, and a really good storyteller. <sighs> <laughs> On today's show, we go northwest to the lovely city of Bayeux. I went to Bayeux a few years ago, but you just came back from there. I just came back. So it's all fresh in your mind, which is wonderful. But fresh, fresh, fresh. Yes, but you know me, the thing I thought about was the food, obviously. And so I looked up what sort of food they do in Bayeux. And what came up is the wonderful Isini, Disini butter and cream. Butter, 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 cream, cream, cream. Oh, that fat, butter. Fat, fat, yeah. fat, fat, fat. That butter is so good. Oh my goodness! Here we go. Here we go. This is the this is the the who eats what. And the, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna have to talk about that, obviously, because Normandy yeah. is a region that is famous for its fat, fat cows <laughs> and everything that comes out of them. So yeah. So there's Beurre d'Isigny, and the oh, the the place where I love it is on uh, Thanksgiving. The creme d'Isigny, the vanilla. Oh, you should see her eyes. They're rolling back so in her head good. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a link to it on the, on the show notes. Oh, it's just fantastic. So for, for the show notes, you go to uh, joinusinfrance.com forward slash 38. And we'll have a little music. And uh, then we'll come back and talk about Bayou. <laughs> Okay, we're back. <laughs> She's still into her cream. <laughs> well, you just asked me, where do I use the cream at Thanksgiving? Right. On the pies. When you serve pies, instead of serving it with uh, ice, ice cream, cream, I serve it with Disney cream. Crème fraîche. Chantilly, crème chantilly. Mm. The whipped cream. That's what I meant. I wasn't clear, was I? No. <laughs> Just the word cream makes your eyes shine, so... <laughs> We know that. <laughs> okay. So just a few weeks ago, I explained how we wanted the show to grow up and pay its own bills. Uh, we're not yet there yet, but we have made some progress. Thank you to those who are helping us out. Now, if you're going to be buying something from Amazon anyway, we would really appreciate if you'd go through our website first. It will not cost you a penny more, and we get a small commission to help support the show. So how do you do that? Uh, when you're sitting down to order something from Amazon... Just go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash Amazon. Then click on your country flag, order what you need, <laughs> whether it's Disney butter or cream or anything else right, you might else. want. <laughs> She's going to be obsessed for the rest of the day, I can tell. <laughs> anything you need, um, whether it has something to do with France or not, you pay exactly the same, you support the show at the same time, and it makes us feel appreciated. So. Very much appreciated. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's all I have to say for about that. Okay. <laughs> so, Normandy. Ah, uh, Normandy. Normandy. Ah, uh, Normandy. <sighs> yes. Why are we sighing like this? What it's is a it? nice we're, place. We're living in the southwest of France, and we're sighing about Normandy. Normandy is actually a huge region, uh, <clears throat> which has been divided up into many, many departments. And I do we need to remind everybody that a department is the equivalent of a county, but much bigger and has a lot more administrative importance than a county would in the United States. Yeah. And uh, uh, the departments are something that were created actually by Napoleon I. I've just spent a lot of time dealing with Napoleon again, so he comes back <laughs> all the time somehow. Uh, and uh, what happened was that Normandy was, for a very long time, going way, way, way back, a separate kingdom. Mm. And it was a kingdom where it was the Dukes of Normandy, and they were very, very powerful. The land is very rich, and it goes, it, it's really huge when you take a look at a map. In fact, if you go into a travel book store, which mm -hmm. I did when I was just up in Paris last week, it's very interesting because almost all the books are divided up so that you have one book for Upper Normandy, 
and another book for Lower Normandy. Really? It's yeah, that big? It's yeah. that big. It's, hmm. that, it's really huge. And I, I'm not sure how many uh, departments altogether, but it really covers a lot of territory. And a lot mm-hmm. of it, is, of course, is very ancient. And it happens to be a region that is accessible to a lot of people who live in the Paris area because pretty much everywhere you go, it's about... Two hours, maybe a little two an hour, two hours and fifteen minutes away. Right, you can't really go that much farther. If you go further, you wind up being in Brittany, and that's really, really far Different. west. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the the area of Normandy, we'll talk about some other parts of it, like the city of Rouen, which is a very beautiful city. But for now, what I want to talk about because it's very beautiful. I was just there, and it's an in a lovely area. And uh, is this little town or small city, I guess we could say, of Bayeux, uh, which is in Lower Normandy. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, you you know, you hear no Lower Normandy. I guess you think, oh, it must be south of Paris. Well, no, of course not. It's not. <laughs> it's west and slightly north. And uh, the easiest way to get there, unless you are renting a car and driving in the countryside, is mm-hmm. simply to take the train. Yeah. And there are uh, trains that uh, run very, very often, every single day from Paris that stop in Bayeux. And there are some, sometimes you have to change because uh, there's a train that will stop in uh, Cannes. 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 I don't know why I have so much trouble with that city. You can't say that word. I can't say that word. I can't say that city. I hate that city because I can't say it. (laughs) It's spelled C-A-E-N. Yeah. Which is only about... uh, Oh, it's... 15 miles, it's 20-something yeah. kilometers just yeah. to the east. Uh, and then uh, there's also a direct train uh, that is lovely to take that will take you right there because it's on the run that goes to a very big city that's further up in Brittany named Rennes. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to get to, and it's also a great place to stop and rent a car for a day or mm-hmm. two because one of the things about Bayeux is uh, that it's in the middle of a lovely, lovely area, and it's not very dramatic landscape. It's mostly either the seaside, which is only seven kilometers as the crow flies away, Mm -hmm. and I asked, uh, uh, we had to take a taxi to get someplace, and I asked the taxi driver, and he said, 10 minutes and you're at the shore or at the beach, you know. Yeah. And uh, otherwise you have... This is not the Riviera. (laughs) No, this is not the Riviera. (laughs) Seven kilometers in the Riviera would take you an hour. Not only that, but (laughs) it's it's really, uh, it's a region where, aside from the historical importance of the beaches, because we'll talk about that in a minute, which had to do, of course, with D-Day at the department. Yeah. It's a region where the beaches are relatively undeveloped. So they're very beautiful. Now, it is... Going if you go in the water there, you're going to very cold water. Yeah. Because this You'll is freeze. this is the channel. Uh, mm-hmm. This is not even the Atlantic yet. This is the channel. Mm-hmm. But the beaches are absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely all these all these people beaches. who who swim across the chan the channel they that's where they go. And yeah, and, that's yeah. yeah. Well, there are lunatics everywhere in the world. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> no, they're just, wonderful. I mean, it's uh, kudos. You know, good right. on them. But the, oh, although it, 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 you have to know that at this place if you go uh, from by your uh to the coast you're at one of the widest spots that's true that is channel. very wide this yeah. is not usually where they go i think they go up more by calais where it's a little bit shorter distance you know <laughs> <laughs> otherwise they'd have to go zigging and zagging in between every I one know. of those cargo <laughs> ships that go up and down the channel anyway yeah. um so why by you well by you happens to be uh it was graced by by whatever gods are up there somewhere because it is the one of the only two towns in all of Normandy that was spared destruction during World War II. Uh, the other being a very beautiful small town on the coast, which we will uh, eventually get to talk about, which is called Honfleur, mm-hmm. uh, which is very beautiful and which is very picturesque and extremely touristy. But Bayeux uh, had the luck, if you will, of being the town that is the immediate town south of Omaha Beach. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the Germans had occupied it. Uh, the Americans, when they landed and eventually got off the beach, and uh, we can refer you back to our wonderful episode about the D-Day invasion. The special, yeah. Which we'll, I'll just mention very briefly. I think that was briefly. episode 18S, I think, oh. if memory serves. Oh, that's a good, you have a good memory for things yeah. like that. Yeah. But uh, what happened was that Bayeux, which is really considered to be a small city, 
today has a population of about 14,000 people. It was so it's pretty small. I mean, it's pretty small, but it it functions. It's not a village, you know. You no. it, it, you really get the sense of it. it. First of all, it's not small because of what it has inside it, mm-hmm. but also it it's busy, and so uh, because it's a largely agricultural area, it t- tends to feel more like what it is, which is a small city rather mm-hmm. than just a, a, a big village. Mm-hmm. But it wound up being the uh, headquarters for the immediate uh, armies when they arrived. And I'm not sure exactly why, but they managed to circumvent Bayer when they did all of their bombing. They bombed mm. more to the west. Mm. And we'll, I'll talk about one of the places that we did go to and saw, which is uh, saint May I which was the famous place that was bombed practically to smithereens. Mm. Uh, and that was further to the west in the region up north. And then it was bombed more to the east, but for some lucky reason, Bayer was not. Was so spared, yeah. it is a city that is documented as going back as far as the uh, Celtic population. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really the home in this region of the Druids and all of that. Oh, you know? cool. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm not sure if you would ever walk down the street, you can't really ask somebody, are you a druid or are you a descendant <laughs> of a druid? I don't think anybody really knows exactly what they did, but no. they were obviously the uh, the religious elite of, of the of the Celtic population that lived there. And it, it, it's interesting because it, it was a population that was apparently very, very important. And so it was taken over by the Romans, just about like everything else, yes. uh, as they were. But in this case, it was much after the Southwest, because this is when they were moving further north, trying Took to get across the channel. Took them a while to channel. get there. Yeah. Because yeah. they wanted to get across to the, uh, to the British Isles. And of course, it was there that they got stymied anyway. Mm-hmm. But, but there is a lot of uh, evidence that they created a very big city in uh, and around what is now the the uh, town of Bayeux, because it was a good trading post. And uh, it was also true, apparently, that at the time, it was uh, closer to uh, other places that were on the Roman roads, and they were trading. And now, it, what's interesting to know is, what did they trade? Well, of of all things, they traded timber. Oh. Because it was a hugely, it was thickly forested as an area. Oh. Is uh, which, it still like that now? No. Yeah. Now it's what they call bocage. Yeah. And bocage is a very special, interesting word because it refers to the fact that uh, the fields are surrounded by large hedges and yeah. trees that s- divide them up and separate them out. There are there are small cups of, of trees, you know, little bunches of trees, but it's not common anymore to see big forests there it's all pasture mm-hmm. land mm-hmm. pretty much mm-hmm. now and i believe that it was just about at the roman times that they started cutting down a lot of the forest and turning it okay. into pasture land one of the things that's happened recently in archaeology is that they do a lot of these low flying uh, little planes over an area like that yeah and what happens is that they can see from up above a uh, certain configuration in the in the land, especially if it's pasture land, that you wouldn't see them when you're walking on it, mm-hmm. and they can tell if it had event- if it had had some kind of constructions under the Roman times and things like that. Oh, it's wow. pretty neat. I've seen this done several times. Cool. It's really cool. So, uh, and it is apparently the Romans that were the first to basically cut down much of the forest in the area. Okay. Yeah, because I don't remember a lot of forest no. driving around there. No. There are still small parts of Normandy and then, of course, of Brittany that have lots of thick forests. Of course, of course. But basically, it's what we do have is something very green. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a land similar in some ways to parts of southern England. And I assume that a long, long time ago, millions of years ago, probably England was attached to it at that point, you know? Right, before then. And so it's uh, very, very, very green because it rains a lot. Mm -hmm. It's got the uh, Atlantic coastal kind of climate, Mm -hmm. which means that it's never extremely cold. It's never extremely hot. Yeah. Well, never is a big word because (laughs) now everything's changing and you never know where anything is anyway. Yeah. But it does get a lot of moisture. Yeah, it's it's a wet area. And it's gorgeously green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you've been someplace that's very hot and dry 
it's a nice place to go to after that. It kind of it's relaxing, you know. If, if you're from Arizona, if you're from Arizona, or if you're from if you've been in Provence in the middle of the summertime, yeah, yeah. you know, if you go up to Normandy, people say, and I think it is really true, that it's more relaxing. It's a kind of there's yeah. a kind of quietness to it. And so there we were wandering around and coming on the train, you get to see the land change as you leave Paris. And you leave all these massive suburbs and everything. Mm -hmm. And you eventually get to this green kind of nice rolling land. And there are probably a lot of Parisians who go to Normandy for the weekend. Lots and lots of Parisians yeah. go to Normandy for the weekend. Not necessarily this far, but uh, there are people that actually even commute. Oh, wow. Well, you know, it, it obviously... Is it a, a fast train? Or it's is... a two-hour ride. Okay. So I don't so think a lot a of people... No, but no. it's a decent train. You know, mm -hmm. it's a relatively fast train. I wouldn't say that a lot of people commute on a daily basis, but uh -huh. it's a place where if you have to go two or three times a week, it's really possible to do that. Yeah. And uh, I met someone who worked four days a week and uh, actually went the opposite way that you would go. In other words, went into Paris four days a week and came home for three days on the weekend. Mm. Uh, and that's obviously very feasible. Lots of Parisians own homes or rent homes in Normandy mm -hmm. in general because mm -hmm. it's a region that's beautiful, bucolic, yeah, and not very far from Paris. Yeah. You know, so it's really yeah. lovely. So we have this area, and Bayeux has, still has a little bit of the Roman ruins, not too much, but what it does have is an absolutely magnificent old city center from the Middle Ages and the early Middle Ages because... Bayeux is the place that was, at that time, the capital of Normandy. Ah. Oh. It got moved later on. Yes. So to what? my favorite city that I can't pronounce. Okay, so it's Caen. Caen. Yes. It got moved yeah. afterwards to Caen. Yeah. But at the time that we're going to talk about this wonderful story, so we can talk about the <laughs> tapestry, it was, in fact, the capital of the Dukes of Normandy. Mm -hmm. And the Dukes of Normandy, believe it or not, were Vikings who had been civilized. <laughs> and this is really an amazing story. Now, most people know this, but uh, that just, is most people here know about it. What? what just, we... just coming to France, civilized them. C civilized. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, yeah, and eating all that butter, obviously. <laughs> it just calmed down their stomachs, it's I guess. It's true. You know? If you want butter, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. Yes. You have to be patient. So, yeah. Yeah. so it turns out uh, that pretty much everywhere on the Atlantic coast of France and including down as far as Bordeaux and down up the Garonne River as far as Toulouse, which is where we are, which is far away from Bayeux and Normandy. Yes. The Vikings raided. Wow. They raided everywhere. They, of course, went to northern uh, England. Mm -hmm. And not only did they raid northern England uh, many times, but then they eventually stayed and probably stayed for the same reason. They must have had nice fat cows there already, you know, or something like that. Because every, interestingly, the Vikings, you know, were uh, not only a warrior people, but they were an incredible sh uh, ocean going people. Mm -hmm. Because we now even have evidence that, of course, they, re they arrived in Newfoundland well before yeah. uh, other yeah. people did. Yeah. And uh, so they raided up and down the Atlantic coast of what is now France. And they went up and down the Seine River. They went as far as Paris several times. They sacked Paris in the uh, 800s. Jeez. And in this area, uh, they came. They basically, of course, pillaged and, and at first really sacked a lot of places. But really, there must have been something about the area that they liked a lot uh, because bands or tribes of these Vikings actually came to the Normandy area starting in the end of the 800s, and they stayed. They settled. Huh. And so by the time we get into the, the early 900s, which is the 10th century, they have settled. They've become farmers, which is interesting when you think about the fact that they were these warriors who were on these boats all the time. Yeah. And they started trading. And, of course, I think they were astute traders, so they must have traded back with Denmark and southern Norway and England and the British Isles, mm -hmm. uh, everywhere they had a kingdom, they created what was called Dane law, which I, is very interesting. I was doing a lot of reading about this, uh, which existed in northern British Isles for a very long time and existed mm. in this area. And by the end of the 900s, they had basically moved into another culture and they had 
more or less adapted the ways of the Franks. And of course, the Franks were the people that were in Paris and had a king. The, the uh, earliest kings were the Capetian kings. Yeah. And they had adopted their language and they had adopted their administrative uh, values. <laughs> and they became dukes, which is, of course, a title that is a Frankish title, mm-hmm. thanks to Charlemagne mm-hmm. and all these people. And they gave themselves the titles of dukes of Normandy. And the land they controlled was enormous, very rich, prosperous agricultural land. And they traded. They were considered to be feudally... Uh, uh, f- loyal to the king of France, but they were really separate. <laughs> and so there was a Duke of Brittany, there was a Duke of Normandy, there was the king of France, which was a small kingdom, really, at the time. At yes. the time. Yeah. And you have all, the, there was a Duke of Champagne who was also extremely rich and powerful. And they became uh, these wonderful people that we call the Normans. And the Normans yeah. simply means the men from the north. Yes. And that is why Normandy is called Normandy. Normandy, the place of the north. The place of the north, Mm. the place of the people of the north. And so what happens is that in the interim, there is this kind of convoluted uh, relationship between England, which has been basically taken over by these northmen who have mixed in with the local Angles and Picts and Saxons. I mean, it's really, I mean, England's is kind of a, a very mixed kind of bag there. And uh, they go back and forth across the channel all the time mm-hmm. so that the Dukes of Normandy are actually cousins with the people who are now ruling England. And, of course, oh. England, in spite of being a very small country for centuries, had different groups of people disputing who should be king <laughs> and, you know, whose, whose family it was entitled to be king. Yeah. And so... What happens is we come to the uh, 11th century, the 10 hundreds, and there's a king in England named Edward. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're in the year just about 1060. So we're really talking almost a thousand years ago. Long time right? ago. And, and Edward, poor man, has no legitimate children. I see. And so he has to designate who is going to inherit his throne. Okay. And the reason he has to do this is that if he doesn't, all of these feuding lords, we'll just Gloucester, Can- I mean, Gla- Canterbury, all of these, yeah. these lords coming from all over, north, south, east, and west, uh, they're going to say, no, 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 we, uh, we are the people who should me, become king. Me, 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 me. Yeah. me, me, me. Yeah. So he has a brother-in-law. I, I mean, it's weird to say that because it sounds so modern, you know, but in fact, that's exactly what he was. It was yeah. a brother-in-law who was someone who wanted to be designated king, and his name was Harold. Okay. But unfortunately for him, Edward decided that his cousin, William, Wilhelm in the old language, William for us who yes. speak English, who was the Duke of Normandy, yes. should become King of England. Oh, I see. So he, he picked he actually the cousin over the brother-in-law. Over, over the brother-in-law. Why? Okay, well. well, it happens that when he picked him, uh, William was, uh, had been Duke of Normandy for over 20 years. He mm-hmm. was already about 40 years old, which is very interesting to know because you can't, at the, in those days, you would not imagine that people really lived that long anyway. Uh, but he considered him to be the better ruler okay. and he was his cousin. And so he made Harold, who was his brother-in-law, swear allegiance to him, that is the King Edward in England, and swear that he would be loyal to his uh, job, which, which was to go across the channel and go meet with uh, William, uh, whom he knew anyway, yeah. and tell him the good news. Okay. The good news is, guess what? You're going to be nominated King of England, right? Not a bad gig. And this is not bad, <laughs> considering that you're already Duke of Normandy, which means you're already one of the richest people around yeah. And you have this huge kingdom and you deal very well with all of these other factions and you're warring a little bit with the Duke of Brittany, but it's not too bad. And you're warring a little bit with the King of France, but not too bad. Uh-huh. And you're married to a woman, a wonderful woman named Mathilde, who was the daughter of the Duke of Flanders. Uh-huh. And so what happens, and it's a wonderful story, uh, is that Harold takes a group of soldiers and people and with his boats goes across the channel to announce the good news to his cousin William 
But he has the bad luck uh, with the currents and bad weather of landing in the wrong place. Uh. And he gets taken prisoner by the Duke of Brittany, ah. who is warring with... The so Duke he, of Normandy. So he went too far west. He went too far west. Okay. Yeah, because okay. the currents, they're apparently moving that direction. And it, and there are times when there's terrible fog on the channel. And we're talking <laughs> in the year 1065 or 1064 uh-huh. or something like that. That's a long time. And, you know, it's a long time. The boats look like the Viking boats with the drackers, you know, with the carved heads. I mean, it's yeah, just really yeah, fabulous. Yeah. yeah. And so what happens is, like, this happens a lot. And it happened again for centuries and centuries. Uh, The Duke of Brittany, when he realizes who he has, that is, he's an important emissary of the King of England, uh, he ransoms him him off Uh to the Duke of Normandy. Okay. (laughs) And uh, so the Duke of Normandy has to come and pay money to get Harold back. And he's going, God, I can't believe I got to pay money to get this guy out, you know, of jail. But what happens in the interim is that uh, Harold, who is already probably humiliated by the fact that he hasn't been designated as as the in, uh, inheritor of the throne yeah he is in, he is humiliated by the treatment he receives from the duke of brittany and then apparently and this is according to the texts that were written a little bit afterwards probably also disparaged and a bit humiliated by the duke of normandy for being treated a bit like how did you manage to get yourself caught by this duke of brittany yeah and, and what happens is that this humiliation uh, works on him. So he goes to the court in Bayeux mm-hmm. in this magnificent, magnificent stone stone castle that is right next to this magnificent cathedral, which is still there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely superb and very, very unusual because of the size of it and the way it has these spires and domes. And tells the Duke of Normandy, Guillaume, William, the good news. And William prepares to go across the channel to be given the throne of England. And, of course, this is a preparation that's going to take a certain amount of time. So so William does pay the ransom to get Harold out. He, he pays the ransom. Okay, he brings okay. him back to his court. Harold In tells him this story, right? And then oh, William, who is obviously no idiot, he thinks to himself, hmm, you know, he, this guy's been through a lot, and <laughs> I have to make sure that he is not going to betray me uh, and he is going to go back to Edward, who was this dying old man, and tell him, yes, I am aware of the fact that I've been designated King of England, and uh, I'm I'm coming, you know. Yep. Uh, coming is going to take about six months of preparation, building ships, having this huge armada or flotilla, if you want to call it that, <laughs> to go back across the channel the other way because he has to bring hundreds and hundreds of people and animals and all kinds of things with him. Oh, wow. And so he sends Harold back with a, a royal entourage uh-huh. to send him back to England to tell Edward, guess what? We're coming. And Harold, who has sworn allegiance by kissing his feet and, and, and having his head ennobled, you know, and all this stuff, he <laughs> goes across back. When he gets back, Edward has already died. Ah. And he takes the crown. Oh. Ah. He betrays his cousin and he betrays Edward. Yes, he did. And so he anoints himself king of England. And this is where the troubles start. Now, troublesome enough before. Troubles were already up. But just think of it. If this hadn't happened or if he hadn't lost the battle that follows, we probably wouldn't be speaking any words that have French in them at all in the English language. In fact, I don't know what we'd be speaking. Me, anyway. You you were born in France. <laughs> I, you'd be still speaking French. But guess what happens? Harold has with him in the entourage someone who's been sent by Guillaume as a spy to make sure that Harold doesn't betray him. Now, hang on, hang on. You keep switching names. This, this same person has three names. Wilhelm. Guillaume and William. William. Because Guillaume is the French... French. William is William the, the Conqueror, and Wilhelm okay, is I'll stay like with Germanic. It's the real name. It's really what he was. It's it's written W I L L E L M Wilhelm Wilhelm, which became William. Yeah. In, all right. So, so we'll I'll call stick him to William the William, Conqueror. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because if you switch back and so forth, so he we... was very he, he was very clever. He included a spy that uh, f- sent back messengers to William and said. He has betrayed you. He has crowned himself king of England. Uh-huh. So not only does he prepare this 
a series of boats to go across to be crowned king of England. But, but now, now we are, now we have an armada. Yeah. And we're going to have a war. And this war takes place on the coast of England in Hastings. I see. Very famous, very famous in all the books that we always read, the Battle of Hastings in the year 1066. Okay. And there's this huge battle, enormous, enormous battle. I don't know if they know really how many people on both sides in terms of the army because what happened to Harold was that he had part of England behind him but he also had other lords that were English lords who were not okay the, with on his, his plan. side. Yeah, okay. So they did not join him to fight. Otherwise, he probably would have won in the Battle of Hastings. So they have this ter- terrible battle. They say that literally uh, the number of boats that went across is the it is only the only thing that was bigger than the number of boats that went across from Bayeux and the coast of Normandy to England is what happened on D-Day in 1944. Okay, so there were a lot of ships. Lots of ships. Lots and lots of ships. Okay. And so William arrives with his army. This is a huge, powerful duke, the Duke of Normandy. And at this famous Battle of Hastings, Harold gets killed ah. by an arrow that gets uh, that actually goes through his eye. Oh, uh, you know, this we're talking early, <laughs> early Middle Ages, you know, I mean, bows Jeez. and arrows. I and mean, this is just bows and arrows and, and um, st- what do you call them? There's the sticks, you know, with points on them that you hit people over the head with, you know, I mean, uh-huh. uh, and of course, <laughs> shields and, and armor. And uh, after this very long battle, which is really uh, documented as being an incredibly long and, and terrible battle. Yeah. Uh, William is the conqueror. He is the uh, winner. Uh, uh. And William the Conqueror rides to London yes, and is crowned. Actually, I think he's crowned in Hastings by the, the, the court. And he becomes the King of England. Wonderful. And what does he do? He brings with him an entourage that speaks French. Well, yeah. He, right? Yeah. This is the <laughs> court of Normandy. By this time, is speaking old French. I mean, you and I, neither of us yeah, would yeah. understand a word of what they were saying anyway. I mean, this is, you know, this is <laughs> not... That'd be amusing. It, it would be, you know, it's a totally different language, but it, would, it actually is old French. Yeah. And the court and the administration of England from then on for well over 200 years do not speak... Old English, they speak French. Okay. And what has happened... Pick your old language. (laughs) ...is that the language that we now know as English, which is about 40% French... Yeah, there's a lot of French words in English. 40%. I was looking this up. I was just checking all of these different things. About 10% Norse or Viking words, Mm -hmm. 40% French, maybe a little bit, about 10% Germanic words, Dutch Germanic words, and the rest Anglo words, anglo pick sax words, which are the original words of the people yeah, there. Yeah. So what happens is that William winds up being King of England and still is Duke of Normandy. Now, he doesn't die until 1087. So he lives another 21 years. Oh, so he lived old. He lived to be old. He actually lived to be in his 60s. Mm. And he united a good part of the Kingdom of England... And what he did was, was, which is quite remarkable, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why, in spite of what, who knows exactly what he was like, I kind of like him. He <laughs> was, he really uh, apparently was in a very, very good marriage with this woman, Mathilde, who okay. was herself the daughter of a duke. And he left her in charge of administrating the, the, the kingdom of Normandy ah. for a couple of years while he settled down in England ah. to make sure everything was okay. <clears throat> And she turned out to be a wonderful administrator. Mm. And then he had her come over on a ship about two years later. I have no idea whether in the interim he went back and had conjugal visits with her <laughs> in the two years in between. Yeah, well. But she came over and she was crowned queen of England. Uh, so it was William and Matilde, the king and queen of England. And it forever, forever and forever changed the course of history, yeah. both for England and for France, because thanks to that, The English claimed parts of France for hundreds of years, which, of course, eventually 500 years later led to the 100 Years War. Right. Because you have all of this intermarrying and you have all of these blood connections, actually, between the 
the thrones of England and the thrones of France. Right. And so while he, this is of course leading up to this thing that is so fabulous, which is he did this in 1066. In 1080, a, a group of, it is believed because no one knows for sure exactly who the people were who did this, but in 1080, a series of textiles were made that are called this fabulous uh, Bayou Tapestry, right. which is not a tapestry at all. It is a series of pieces of linen cloth that Very are long. embroidered in yes. wool. Yes. And it is 70 meters long. Yes. And parts of it, actually, they would think it was longer because if you, and I just saw it two days ago again, the last section is truncated. You can see that there were p pieces that belong to it that are no longer there. But this is embroidered mm -hmm. in woolen thread mm -hmm. in five or six magnificent colors. And it tells the entire story of what I have just told you and, of course, everybody out there in fine detail so oh, that yeah. you see what they're wearing. You see the foods that they ate. Mm -hmm. you, you see, see the horses. What, you the, see the horses. The ships. You see the ships. You see the waves in the, in the water as there's, they go across. There's even um, a, a section where you see Halley's Comet. Yes. Which they saw in 1044. That's right. And it's, it's right there. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And apparently it was considered to be an omen that things were going to change, oh, of course, in, in England. I, I mean, this was uh, not considered to be, hey, you know, let's go take a look at the comet. It was like, uh-oh, what's going to happen to us now? Ah. You know? But the tapestry, which is uh, unfortunate that it's called a tapestry because it really isn't. It was done, of course, by a series, a group of people, and it was done while he was still alive. This mm. is what's so amazing about it. So can you imagine he actually saw it? William the Conqueror was able saw to it. see his own... <laughs> This is, story this, is, told. this is his own story in posterity, and it is magnificent. Oh, yeah. It's, and it's absolutely superb. And you I know? have, you know, I have no interest in tapestries or stuff like that in general. I have, I mean, I have done a little bit of cross-stitching uh -huh. when I was much younger. Right. But, and, yeah, it's, it's that sort of work, except exquisite. It's I exquisite. Mean, it's just like... And the colors are very nice. The colors, and it hasn't faded. Right. And if you go slow, you can tell some of the things that are happening. Right. It's like a kind of a comic strip. Well, it's exactly what it know? is. And, and in <laughs> fact, that's what, that's what the, now when people talk about it, art historians will say. It is literally, in its animation, it's like an enormous freeze that moves from one end yeah. to the other. And it's so dynamic and you see the battle scenes are fabulous even though they're a little bit you know i mean they don't show the blood but you see people yeah. and horses being decapitated and yeah. you see the ships going across the channel when he comes across with his armada it's absolutely fabulous you see yeah. the foods he brought you see everything you see birds you see all kinds of things flying around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i took a good look at it because it's a kind of it's not cross stitching it's a very dense embroidery so that the threads have a tendency to all go the same direction, which gives this wonderful texture because you see the, the, the clothing that they wore, you see when they're wearing the armor. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just magnificent. It's, it ends right before. I would love to have seen Matilde, you see, and I, there's no Matilde in this, except oh. that I think there's one scene at the very beginning. And yet one of the names for it is the Matilde um, Tapestry. Isn't that interesting? Oh, oh. Maybe no. it was made maybe in she, honor. Maybe it was made in honor of her. Or maybe, maybe she commissioned it. Maybe she commissioned it, you know, yeah. for a dear hubby. I have no idea, you yeah. know. But it's, uh, it was kept in the monastery in Hastings in England oh. and then eventually brought back to Bayeux. Mm -hmm. And uh, William's brother-in-law was a man named Odon. O-D-O-N. It's a funny name, but it's very common for that time period in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for the building of this cathedral that is still in Bayeux, which is, I have to say, and you and I both like cathedrals and like going into them. Yes. This is spectacular. You know, I must have gone in and I don't remember it because this is before I started taking pictures. Right. And so I haven't seen it since. The inside, though, is it's fabulous because it's got carvings on the in stone on the walls. And part of it is rarely this is rare for france it's actually part of it is actually from 
the 11th century, that is from the end of the 10 hundreds. Mm, mm. And then of course it was rebuilt in the 12th century and then rebuilt again in, in a little bit later in Gothic times, but it's more fabulous even from the outside mm -hmm. because it has spires everywhere. It's enormous. It's mm -hmm. absolutely enormous. When you think about it in relation to the size of the town. Yes. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, apparently after a number of years, uh, after William died, he was brought back to Normandy to be buried. Mm -hmm. And the tapestry was brought back and placed in the cathedral. Oh. So for a very, very long time, it Isn't was in the cathedral itself. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, it's in a separate building, which is a museum. Yes. And it's the building that it's in is a magnificent building that's also from the end of the 1600s that was a monastery building mm -hmm. that was built, of course, later on. And it's very, it's fabulous because there's a free audio guide. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my only criticism of the audio guide is that it goes too quickly because mm. all the scenes have been numbered up above. And so if you want to take time to linger over one scene, you basically have to l stop because the audio guide is not one like in some other museums where you can put it, turn it on and off. It just oh. keeps going. Which is a shame because... They probably want you to keep moving along, though. I'm sure that's true because, yeah. obviously, I was just there and it's now October and there were very few people there. But in the summer, it gets very, very crowded yeah. because people come there to visit the town because it's so beautiful. They come there because of the Bayou Tapestry and they come there because it's a wonderful place to stay to go and visit the different sites of the uh, D-Day mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. or the history of the area. So, uh, but, but it, it's really quite astonishing to imagine that this is something that is just about an, almost <laughs> a thousand years old. Yeah. And, and that was beautiful. such beautiful, beautiful detail. The Absolutely beautiful detail. The colors are really nice. And I like how they present it because they keep the rooms uh, pretty dim. Dim, right. And then the impression that it gives is that the tapestry is super bright, even though it's probably not lit that much because they don't want to damage the right. colors. But it's it's a really beautiful... It's fabulous. Know. And we went with... Uh, so this is years ago. Our daughter was probably 9 or 10 or something. And even as a little kid, she thought it was interesting. Oh, yeah. Because I presented it like, uh, you know, this is a story. It's Look, like a comic story. Yeah, they're, they're clubbing each other right. over the head. They're harvesting. They're putting animals right. in cages. They're, you know, and you can present it that way. And it's also a nice respite, but this this is just me, but when you go to Normandy and you do a lot of touring of World War II right. events, it gets heavy. It gets it, very heavy. It gets like, oh, you know. And Bayeux is, I mean, it's still war and carnage, but it's long ago. Long enough ago, Long ago. <laughs> that right. you know, it's kind of funny from our perspective to see all these people clubbing each other with whatever it is they I were. I think it's called a mace, actually. I think that's the word in English, M-A-C-E. I think it's a mace. A mace? Yeah. I, I don't know that word. word. Yeah, I'm going to look it up, but I believe it's a kind of club that has little spikes uh, uh, on uh, the uh, end. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. But you're <laughs> absolutely right. And, 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 of course, the thing is, is that... Uh, the, the town itself is, is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And this is the other thing that's so surprising. Because it has preserved all of its medieval architecture, it has over 70 houses that date from the 1300s, which is remarkable. Yeah. It has stone bridges that cross over the two little rivers. One of them is the Ore, A-U-R-E. It has windmills and uh, mills of all kinds it has yeah it's there's just a, absolutely gorgeous little town yeah there's some beautiful pictures of uh, this area that has a, a wind the, uh, a, a uh, water mills. water mill water mills and a bridge right and it looks lovely it's uh, lovely you, you it's go lovely. To, if you go to the website you'll you'll find it and it's, and we stayed in a lovely little uh very small little hotel that had a restaurant mm -hmm. and there are uh, two or three right in the center that are literally five minutes away from both the tapestry and the cathedral without any problem mm -hmm. and of course one of the things that's very nice i have to say is having spent some days prior to that in paris is that it's less expensive of uh, course everything's less expensive the hotel rooms are less expensive you can go to a very chic and very fancy there's actually a Five star? No, I think there's a. There are two four star hotels in Bayeux, but then there are others that are 
three and two stars that are very lovely, perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the food uh, is is very good, and of course, it's not quite as pricey as it is in Paris. Right. Of so of course, now we can get to the stuff that helps that helps make your eyes shine. You know, <laughs> uh, one of the th what is the specialties of the area? Well, obviously, everything made with cream and butter, and of course, camembert, and that is where you get the Isigny, yes. uh, which is a huge, huge, huge factory that produces cream and the best butter probably in France, uh, and a wonderful camembert. It, uh, it really has a distinctive flavor. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, French butter in general is better than American butter. Yeah. Um, those are the two that I know best. Uh, but the beurre d'Isigny is really very nice. Now, I would venture to say, and I don't know if it's 100% true, but I would guess that when you drive in the countryside around Bayeux and you go to, even as you go on your way to uh, the Omaha Beach memorial sites and all of that, you pass through magnificent rolling land with pasture land and mm -hmm. you have these magnificent huge fat cows <laughs> and the grass they're eating, they say that when it's close to the ocean, it has a certain flavor to it. So oh. I wonder if that isn't what gives the distinctive taste to the butter and the cream it could of this be. area. I don't know what it would be. I mean, because it's it's a little bit different. It's a little know? bit I mean, different. It's still a butter, but it's it's a little bit it's different. It's a little bit different. It's, 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 it's very rich. Yes, it it tastes a little creamier and richer. I don't know. It's just delicious. But so, for so, special occasions, it's really good. And and it is really an, uh, Normandy is known for all of its cow dairy products, which yes. really relates to cheese, cream, and of course butter. Mm -hmm. And this part of Normandy, uh, which is in the Calvados department, is famous with one or two other departments nearby for its production of apples. Yes. And the apples here are used to be made into cider. Mm -hmm. And to the famous alcohol called Calvados, yes, which is actually an apple brandy, yes, and uh, it's made in the same exact way as you would make a brandy made out of grapes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's very strong. It's very strong, and it's, it's not sweet, right? It it, it can be. It, ah. it it's like it's like Armagnac, which is uh, what I mean by that is that if you get a, a Calvados and you keep it for at least ten years, uh huh. It will smooth out, yeah. And it, what I I like it. I happen to really like it. What it's it's like drinking a cognac or a brandy, except that when you drink it and you drink it slowly, you get the aftertaste of apple, mm -hmm. which I love. I mm -hmm. absolutely love. Mm -hmm. So it has a certain sweetness to it, yeah. But at the same time, it's strong because it's an alcohol. It's a liqueur, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. It's, it's it's not a wine, but it's probably like forty percent alcohol. It's forty percent. It's yeah. just like brandies and, yeah. and armagnac. So yeah. it's not a wine. There yeah. is no wine producing area in Normandy at all. I see. Because of the region, because of the climate, so they do produce enormous amounts of apples and cider. And they also do export apples to the northern part of France mm -hmm. from this region. Mm -hmm. But it's when you walk, when you drive through the countryside, and there are hundreds of tiny, gorgeous little villages around there. Mm -hmm. You see the pasture land with the cows, and then you'll see another field that's filled with apple trees. And of course, this was we're about halfway through the apple season, so there were still lots of trees that had apples on them, mm -hmm. which of course I absolutely right, right. love. You love the cream. I love the apples. You know. Fine. The this apples stuff. too. Uh, and what was what was really nice <laughs> I like was, everything. There was the restaurant we, we ate in. Um, it had a lot of different things, and some of them were very ordinary. But it had a, what they called a local menu, and that meant you had a starter, a main dish, and a dessert. And they had a little star next to the thing in the starter that was of local products, uh -huh. and that was a camembert baked with some calvados. Ooh, okay, that would be good. That would be good. The yes. second one for the main <laughs> dish here, we're, we're, gonna he we're heading towards noon. And yes, I'm, it's you know, almost lunchtime. Uh, it's here. almost lunchtime. <laughs> and the second dish was an escalope uh, in a, a, what they s a call a Norman sauce, which means it's got a little bit of cream yeah. and a little teeny, teeny little bit of cider and mushrooms oh that would be and good that too. was delicious and mm -hmm. then the famous dessert which really they claim is theirs and that is tart tatin i see well but tart tatin you didn't you say it was well, like near paris it it it, it sounds well, it's like lots of apples, there are about so. four about four different regions <laughs> that claim it's like it. the macaroons you know it's like yeah. i think they're gonna go to war with one another you know it's like <laughs> we're gonna have a tart tatin oh, no. war you we're know way too lazy for that now <laughs> the other thing that makes going to buy a really great thing to do is that 
uh, whether you have a car or not, you can indeed go on a tour of the things that are connected to D-Day. Uh-huh. Uh, there, we did a tour. Uh, we did a full day tour. And it's a full, full, full day, yeah. really. And as you mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, yeah, there are moments when it can get really heavy. Yeah. It's extremely moving. It's extremely emotional. Yes. And one of the things that is very interesting in this region, in this part of Normandy particularly, is that you sense, aside from the commercial aspect that almost everything, uh, almost everywhere, there's something that somehow winds up being connected to D-Day and the uh, uh, arrival of the Americans. But you really do sense by the memorial sites, by the commemorative places, the the signs, the the objects that they put up, and the small museums almost everywhere. Yeah, lots of them. That this is a region that has not forgotten and will not forget for a long oh, time. No. no, I don't think they will ever forget. They're, it's It's a big deal. Going to Omaha Beach is... Uh, a very moving and very strange experience because yeah. the beach itself is exquisite. Yeah. You also get to see how incredibly difficult it was because the beach is enormous. It's very deep. Whereas if you go further west and go around a place called the Pointe du Oc, which is a place that uh, is up the beginning of the cliffs, and you go on the other side to Utah Beach, which is already going into the more northern part of Normandy. Right. It's... Very different because instead of having enormous amounts of sand that make you a sitting duck, uh, it's a short, rocky beach with a huge cliff. With a cliff, yeah. And uh, it was totally different, the experience of those. So did you do, Did you see both this time? Yes, I saw both this time. Yeah. So, uh, when and, we, and we went there, to the we Colville. Went to the one. And we went to the... To Colville. The, the Colville. Uh, yeah. And... and uh, this time I did what something that I hadn't done the last time. There's a memorial uh, museum in the cemetery, which of course is American land. It's been designated yeah. as American land. It's a magnificent site. It's sad because you have these thousands and thousands and thousands of, of markers for graves, mm -hmm. but it is one of the most beautiful points on the coast. And they've made this brand new wading pool and museum space and it's landscaped in this absolutely exquisite way. Oh, it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's very well worth a visit. It's very well worth a visit. So but we did only, all of it. there's only so many times a day you want to cry while on vacation. That's right. You know what I mean? So you do a, a cup. I mean, for me, a couple of days of, of war history and so forth is really good. But I wouldn't want to do, you know... Two weeks. No, but you know uh, what? I, what we did, which was a very highly saturated one-day full tour. Mm -hmm. uh, my th thought was, uh, it's you do that, and then the next day you do little villages and cows and uh, little, something light. Something light, yeah. and it's because the area is so peaceful and so yeah. beautiful. And when we stopped in a couple of places where they look like. The landscape looks like constable paintings. You yeah. know, the famous <laughs> English uh, painter who did these magnificent bucolic scenes. You have yeah. lovely pasture land, cows. You either have the black and white or you have these brown cows that are native to the area, you know. And mm -hmm. the, the apple orchards and little villages made out of stone with the steepled churches. Yeah. I just want to mention, though, because we did go that far um, as part of the day. We did do all of Omaha Beach. We went to the, to the cemetery. We stopped in a little town that has a memorial to something from uh, one of the airborne divisions because they were, the, of course, the m most important people at, at, at certain points along the way. We went across the Pointe de Oc, which still has the holes in the ground from right. where they bombarded. And then we went to Utah Beach, which is uh, incredible because it's just these straight-down cliffs and they explain how this one group of rangers managed to find a, a space in between rocks along this coastline that is extraordinarily dangerous. But because there was not a lot of beach and because it was so hidden from other sites, they were the ones that were actually the first and most successful to get up onto the land and mm -hmm. move inland. Mm -hmm. But we did also go to saint Mer Eglise, which is a town that you will see if you watch The Longest Day mm -hmm. or if you watch Saving... Private Ryan, yes, because it's the famous town that was almost exclusive, completely destroyed by the bombs, 
and where you still have a memorial. And of course, it is sad, but it's really touching to see of the parachutists who wound up because of the winds being dropped in the wrong place and getting mm. stuck on the churches mm. and therefore being shot down by the Germans because the parachutes got stuck on the spires and they still have a memorial of something with a parachute hanging from the rebuilt church mm. in St. Mary Gris. And right in the town is a small museum dedicated exclusively to the 82nd Airborne Division. Mm. And I, I figured... After that, I've had enough for the day. You yeah, know, it's yeah. it's really. But at the same time, I felt very good because it's true that it's a region that suffered by being n- occupied by the Germans and then, of course, being bombarded by the English and the Americans. Yeah. But it seems to be that it's the region where people still are the most thankful, if you want to call well, it that. Well, of course, you because know? they know. I mean, it just, it happened to them and to their family members. And to their family members. And so interestingly enough, because this is one case where I wasn't doing the guide work. I was actually with a group of people. And because this is a very specialized tour for the D-Day tour, we actually had a driver who was the, the person who was doing the, the talking about all these war sites. Mm-hmm. And his grandmother had been a young woman at the time of the d-day invasion Mm -hmm. so he actually had stories to tell so that was really pretty fabulous yeah but all in all uh it's a wonderful place to go for two three days and there's far more to see also in normandy which we can talk about another time yeah it's a wonderful region and it is one of those areas like going to strasbourg the other way which is a little further but because of the new wonderful trains you can actually go for a couple of days staying in paris or you can go and just have a car and start your travel travels all around France from there. Right, yeah. right. No, it's it's definitely a beautiful a beautiful place to see. I I highly recommend it. And as chance was ha- would have it, somebody who um, oh I can't remember the gentleman's name, but somebody who m- uh, made a comment on the website, um, he was asking. Uh, if it would be okay if he didn't drink wine and coffee and things like that in France. And, and my response to him is, sure, it's fine. Just order something else instead. Right. You know, right. which, and I then mean, nobody will notice. Oh, that's an interesting question. Some people don't drink wine. Uh, I found that m- when we were out with, with my with my group in Paris, <coughs> excuse me, those people who didn't drink wine would order mineral water. Exactly. Order a... Uh, you don't drink Coke with a meal. In France, you really yeah. don't. Well, you know? I I do all the time, but you're barbaric. <laughs> you're American. <laughs> you're not French. And let me tell you, they just bring it to me, and um, it's not a problem. But yeah, um, it's not it's not something that French people do. No, uh, actually, it's but interesting. It's okay to stick out. I mean, but do what you want. The protocol really tends to be that it's really not considered to be terrible to do at lunchtime. But for some reason, at dinner, most people, rather than doing that, I mean, there will be a person that might want to have a soda, but most people will tend to order a Perrier or something like that yeah, or, or yeah. some kind of water if they're not drinking wine. And, and of course... Uh, or these days you have these wonderful uh, fruit, local fruit juices right. that almost every restaurant offers some sort of local, locally produced fruit juice, um, some of them cost just as much as wine, actually. Yeah, and they I had and one that was delicious. And they're very nice. And they're very nice. They're very nice. So, and the, and the thing about coffee is that uh, not everyone drinks coffee. No. And people drink coffee at the end of a meal in Italy and in France. You yeah. don't drink coffee with the meal. But there are people now who will ask for tea at the end of the meal, or yeah. people who just don't drink either. And I, that's all. Yeah, I don't drink any coffee after my meals. Right. I drink coffee all morning long, but I don't drink coffee. But you don't drink later in the day. Not later. Later in the day, and and it's just fine. I, I just decline the coffee. It's not it's not an issue. But yeah. anyway, the reason why I brought him up is because um, we exchanged a few emails. Uh, well, it's all on the website too, um, uh, so other people can read it. Uh, but he is going on an anniversary trip that will include Bayeux, ah. and so <laughs> you know that's, there you are. that's good. You have your tour for you have your tour by by you all all lined up. So you have a, it's a yeah. wonderful wonderful place to be. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention uh, before we finish this podcast is that um, I have noticed 
that the number of people who like us on Facebook is growing very nicely, and I am pleased about that. But I want to let you know that if you rely on Facebook to know when a new episode is available, you shouldn't do that because they only show... What we've already done. Not even that. They only show... Like if I put up a post saying, oh, there's a new episode, here it is, maybe 5% of our of the people who've liked us see it because it shows me how many people were reached right. by this post. Right. Right. And it's very few. It's very few. So I would, I would again, go to the site. Uh, yeah, go to the site, subscribe on the site. That way, if, if we have something to tell you, we will tell you directly via your email. And you know, that's, um, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Cause Facebook, you know, they're nice, but they don't dis they only display what they think you want to see. Right. And they're, they're trying to get pretty, and also their advertising, of course. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Elise. That was a very uh, interesting uh, show. I need to go back to Bayou. It, it was, I don't think we spent enough time in the city. The city is really gorgeous. Yeah. And it's not that big, so it's really lovely to yeah. be able to do it in a day and a half and see all of the, the church and the, the tapestry and walk around and really appreciate it. So you think a day and a half is sufficient? I think a day and a half is sufficient. Bayou. I think you have to include out, outlying areas. I think that's what, what makes it interesting is to go to Bayou, spend a good day and a half, and explore also the outlying areas as well. Mm-hmm. Very good. It's okay. very beautiful. Okay. So listeners, remember, if you are going to buy something on Amazon, go to joinusinfrench.com forward slash Amazon. Click on your country flag. We don't have all the countries, but we have all the big ones. We have the big ones. There's the USA. That's the most listeners we have is in the US. Canada is also pretty big. France is pretty big. UK is pretty big. We also have a lot of listeners in Australia, but... I don't know why Australia just barely got Amazon. And so they don't have the associate program mm. yet, but they wrote to me and they're very nice. And they said, Oh, soon. And so when, when that works, I'll, I'll uh, put a link to for Australia, Good. but we have listeners in so many countries. I couldn't possibly apply to all these, you know, country programs with Amazon. So I have a few, but not all, but anyways, if you could remember before you buy anything on Amazon again, it's not going to cost you any more. So you might as well make us happy. Make us happy. <laughs> now she's going to go have some cream. Oh, I don't think I have any in the fridge. No. But next time I'm, I'm at the store, I might <laughs> indulge. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. See you next week. Au revoir. Au revoir.